Welcome to Pickleball Noise Relief, our second episode regarding pickleball noise and especially the individuals around the country who are experiencing uh, this noise. We would like to broadcast uh, guest speakers that have scientific knowledge and practical knowledge and we're all learning together. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bob. He's just come back from uh, an eight-day referee assignment at the Senior Games in Pittsburgh. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, Bob. He okay. also uh, is the um, columnist for the American, I mean, the um, USA Pickleball Magazine. Uh, his column is called The Rules of Guru. I totally respect all of his work working with vendors and professional players, recreational players, and really trying to address and solve this noise issue. So I'll go ahead and turn over the uh, the meeting to you, Bob, and take it away. And, and afterwards, we'll do a nice Q&A. Okay, excellent, Melanie. And thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to speak to this group. I know essentially all of you are opposed to pickleball, certainly pickleball sound. And so I'd like to talk about how I'd like to bridge that with an understanding of the source of the sound and what's going on and what you and we and people in pickleball uh, can do about this long term. It is a serious problem. I, I agree with that. Um, I took up pickleball in 2013. I uh, bought a condo in Florida and, uh, by t and I was, began to play a rather large amount. I retired from my engineering career. I was a consulting engineer for some years. I owned a couple of electronics companies, um, and I came out of uh, radio, television, and microwave um, broadcast transmission, and I was an expert in waves, but radio waves at very high frequencies. In 2015, uh, our community developed a noise problem. We had some neighbors that complained about, um, by 2015, there was a lot of play on our converted tennis courts, and so some neighbors complained about that, and uh, the HOA hired an acoustics firm to uh, study the problem, and I worked with that uh, acoustics firm because I was a, a member of the pickleball club, and I was an engineer interested in the technology. I worked very closely with them, and uh, working with them, we came up with uh, several possible solutions, and we ended up uh, putting up uh, sound barriers around the courts and controlling the use of paddles and balls. So I had to get deeply involved in testing paddles and balls. This is in about uh, 2015 is when this began. By 2018, we implemented um, the plan and put up barriers, got permits to do this. We needed to replace the courts anyway. So we installed uh, taller fencing and more heavy duty fencing that supports absorbing sound barriers. And if I can share a screen, I will show uh, you um, what that um, set of courts now looks like. Okay, so that's the set of uh, courts in Bonita Bay, Florida. This is a park inside of a gated community. And being a gated community, it is possible to have some say over what uh, balls and paddles people use. And uh, we ended up uh, with 12 foot high barriers. I studied all the available things, all the available materials. And I worked with uh, a variety of vendors and uh, I recommended a vendor out of Indiana called eNoise Control. And I like the colors um, and I like the performance of it. So it's an absorbing uh, set of barriers that completely wraps around the, the, um, the fencing. The closest homes in this community are 168 uh, feet away. So I did that and uh, other people in Florida would come and visit me and uh, I was showing them around Benita Bay and pretty soon some of those folks went back north and found out they had pickleball noise problems up north. They asked me to help them up north. And I developed a method using Google Earth to look at a site, to look carefully at a site and to talk to uh, the related parties that understood the site and uh, to measure distances. And by accumulating a lot of data, I was able to determine quite accurately what pickleball levels could be expected if ordinary equipment or special uh, paddles and balls uh, were used and also what barriers might do. I uh, ended up uh, uh, finding a software package that we lease that allows us to calculate how a barrier or multiple barriers will influence the level of sound. And by 2021, um, I was doing quite a lot of that and uh, I found two other retired engineers. Uh, one has a PhD in acoustics, Dr. Barry Wireman uh, worked for Owens Corning for um, several decades. 
And he joined me and another engineer, Dale Van Scoyt, another electrical engineer like myself, joined me. And we decided to have a company that does this kind of consulting. Basically, we work with anyone who has a potential for a pickleball sound problem. Our advice is you should consider sound before you convert courts or build courts for pickleball or before you convert tennis courts. And, uh, and we also are deeply tied to uh, USA Pickleball. We have uh, all three of us are credentialed referees for USA Pickleball. We know the people there well, and they are vitally concerned about this. And I think Melanie suggested, uh, or maybe Susan suggested it before we started our meeting, that uh, we should develop some standards, these organizations should develop standards. Well, uh, USA Pickleball is preparing a new set of standards, and we've recommended some new standards. But we have to keep in perspective that USA Pickleball has about 100,000 members. There are right now easily 8 million people that play the game regularly, and uh, seven and a half million of them uh, pay no attention to what USA Pickleball says they should do. And so that is a problem. It's who controls pickleball. And I think um, as the problem gets more widely known because of the news media and because of uh, lawsuits and uh, and towns investigating this, it is becoming more widely known. And I hope that will lead to uh, solutions or at least great improvements and an understanding of the problem. So the question is, what do we do? Well, we look at client sites. Now, often a client is a town or township. Very often it's an HOA or a community that wants to do the right thing. And that's an ideal case where we're working with a community that wishes to control the, the sound of pickleball. Uh, often it's clients though, uh, like some of you, who've uh, been battling with the community that did this conversion uh, or plans to do a conversion. And, uh, and you're opposing uh, the implementation of pickleball close to homes. And so we typically look at a site, we look at all the options, and uh, have to recognize that while paddles and balls are a very useful tool in many cases, at public parks, that's very difficult to enforce. None of you want to become the pickleball police. And so a solution that involves uh, uh, different paddles and balls is, is perhaps practical in communities, um, especially HOAs, condos, and, uh, and, and gated communities, but it's less practical in the in public parks until the public gets so widely aware of this that they really want to do something about it. Now, we also test paddles and balls, and uh, we have close ties to some of the paddle manufacturers. And uh, I think the paddle manufacturers uh, are aware of a problem and a need, but in putting it into perspective again, uh, some of them are selling hundreds of thousands or millions of paddles. And uh, if I say to them, I know there's a community that needs 500 new paddles, that's not that impressive to them. And if I say there's a market for 10,000 quieter paddles, sometimes that's not getting their attention either. So I think what we're going to see is some companies are going to specialize in this niche that allows them to make quieter paddle. And we're already seeing some of that. And the bigger companies with greater engineering resources that could really develop uh, paddles and balls with improved technology will get wind of the fact that there's a growing market that they should participate in. Unfortunately, it's a slow process, but I do think that by later this year, there will be a new set of standards that USA Pickleball um, publishes. USA Pickleball is a primary goal, that is to ma maintain the integrity of the game. They want it to be played the same way. They want the game to feel like pickleball feels. And that also means that uh, we don't want it to become a dangerous sport. We don't want a ball that travels much more quickly. A rubber ball like a tennis ball that's heavier would travel more quickly. It might be quieter, but it might become dangerous. So if you take all of those things um, into account. And so um, I have a couple other screens to share, including some information about paddles. What I have found, and um, I know that you, you, some of you uh, have worked with me closely about how to measure sound, how we measure sound. A number of you have seen the reports we use. We decided uh, several years ago to use the particular metrics that are practical. Um, they're often referenced in ordinances, and uh, they're the kind of um, uh, metric that you could go out and uh, measure yourself. And some of you have purchased beaters that we have recommended for doing measurements like this. But a related issue is 
The big difference between one paddle and another is often not the peak power it generates, not the peak sound pressure, but how that decays with time. So we've found and we've studied very closely now the decay characteristics of ordinary paddles. And by ordinary paddles, I mean a fiberglass face, half inch thick, uh, Nomex core, aluminum core paddle, a very hard core paddle with a hard face that has a very high pitch and uh, vibrates back and forth. Uh, substantially, nothing um, reduces that vibration for tens of milliseconds. So for tens of milliseconds, a paddle like this gets hit with the ball and it vibrates like this at a rate of about one kilohertz. And that creates air pressure vibration in that one kilohertz range that we humans find to be very annoying. It's right in the range of speech that we love to be able to discern. We'd like to hear the high pitch sounds and resolve them. And by the way, as you get older, you lose your high frequency here and your very high pitch capability. But we tend to retain that ability to hear one kilohertz. So just getting older does not really reduce your tendency to hear pickleball pop. You still have usually very good hearing in the one kilohertz range. So we find that some paddles though have a much lower pitch. Some of these were done accidentally. I think the sport was developed for low cost, reliable performance and power and winning. And uh, people sell paddles by having a pro sign their name on it and having good put away power. You can imagine that's what uh, people will buy. And so that's a little different than saying, this is the quietest paddle. No pro is saying, I really love this paddle because it's quiet. They love the paddle because it's powerful. And so just having a pro paddle is not the way to get it necessarily quieter. However, the improvements in the sport and materials have led to somewhat uh, quieter paddles and lower pitch paddles. So I uh, have today a set of different paddles that I wanted to very quickly show you. I'm gonna run through the history of paddles and end up with some unusual paddles. And some of you in cases, for instance, a quando that has a tennis court in front of it, a four or five story quando overlooking a tennis court has a very difficult time uh, bringing this pickleball sound level down. If you put a roof over it, fine, but now you block the view and you perhaps have spent a million dollars on a roof. And so people often aren't going to do that. And they're going to tell you things like, well, we're in a noisy area and it's not that loud. But if you can have control over what equipment is used, you do have the ability to go to equipment that's at least 10 decibels quieter, that's less than half as loud as ordinary um, off the shelf equipment paddles and balls that you would buy at Walmart or Dick's or online. So there are options to bring the sound level down. I'm gonna show you some of those and this will be a little quick run through of about five different paddle technologies. So you're familiar with what's going on. And I'm gonna make a little prediction about where we go with this. And then I'd be happy to uh, try to answer uh, questions for you. So let me start with, uh, we'll do a little history first. This is an early paddle. It's uh, over 30 years old and it's a plywood paddle. It's like the first paddles made. As you can imagine, it was made out of plywood. It's inexpensive and it's very noisy paddle. It turns out that Zoom has a very good um, way to reduce background noises to allow our voices to transmit. So I'm not sure you hear that sound like I do, but it's a very sharp uh, ping. This was an original style paddle. Uh, so I can tell you the history though. You all know pretty much what it sounds like. So this was a very noisy paddle. Along came fiberglass paddles like this one that uh, have um, uh, polycore, and they're not substantially different in terms of sound, unfortunately. They were inexpensive to build. They're lighter weight. They played a better game because you had a lighter thing to, to carry around. They hit with lots of power. No, no, it evolved into a, a, a hard plastic ball. Players actually preferred harder plastic and some soft plastic balls were brought to market. So this is an ordinary hard plastic ball. There's two very popular ones, the Dora Fast 40 and the Franklin X. It's a hard ball and it tends to be louder. There's softer balls. They tend to be a little more yellow or a little more green. You can push your thumb into it a little bit and that softness makes it several decibels quieter. The softest of this type is the Monarch. Um, Monarch is a division of Dix. 
And so you could buy some monarch balls in your community and offer them. Balls are inexpensive. So it's a way to go from a harder ball that uh, it tends to be rather loud to a, a somewhat softer ball. If you couple, couple a softer ball with a softer face paddle, now this is a professional level paddle with a, a carbon fiber face. It feels rougher. It has more ball control and it is quieter. It's a quieter hit. Uh, on problem with it is a paddle like this costs $200 as opposed to the $100 version or the $39 really inexpensive version. So convincing people to use it is not that simple. There have been some recent innovations. Here's a paddle. You've seen it on my list. Perhaps you've seen other things about it. This is the Master Athletics and it says the quiet. And it has a thin layer of rubber on the face. And that rubber uh, greatly dampens the hit, and it is a considerably uh, quieter paddle. It's not tournament approved, and so that's a problem. The rules haven't allowed for a surface material like this. Even more unusual is this paddle. It has holes in it. And this is made by a fellow in uh, Punta Gorda. It's the Whisper QT. And if you could hear the sound of this, you would hear it. it's about 10 decibels quieter than an ordinary paddle. There are some communities now that use only this paddle. I appreciate the difficulty. You have to tell people who own paddles that they have to use this other paddle. But if you couple that with a softer ball, then you have more than a 10 decibel reduction in sound level. Um, there's also other people, other entrepreneurs in the field. This is uh, the pickleball muffler that you've probably seen um, advertised. It's an even quieter assembly. It'll get you down... Uh, more than 10 decibels below an ordinary set of equipment. And uh, it has some changes to the ball flight. My, uh, the, the foam rubber inside will uh, act a little differently when it hits a ball. But And so it's not turn, tournament approved. But what is going on is that USA Pickleball is trying to come up with a set of rules and work with manufacturers to um, encourage them. And they're going to give them some sort of incentives um, to come up with quieter paddles so communities that need quieter paddles will adopt those. Um, and we're also working with um, vendors of a barrier material. You know, barrier basically needs to be a heavyweight material that goes, that blocks the line of sight view of the path between the ball strike and the listener. And if you're in a four or five story condo or a two story condo overlooking a court, the barrier is not going to do you much good. But in many places, uh, with single-story homes or homes that sit below the level of the courts, a modest barrier wrapped around the courts um, will do an excellent job. And uh, you need to have the barrier material be heavy enough, and that's on the order of one half pound per square foot. So if you're using heavy enough material to block the path of line of sight, uh, you can uh, reduce the sound level uh, substantially, often by 10 dB. And so if you have a very severe problem, if you use a, ten, a barrier that could reduce the sound level 10 decibels and uh, let's say an unusual paddle like this one, you have the opportunity for a 20 decibel reduction in sound level. So those are the options that some of you have faced. Um, I think some communities have developed those. I see these, these as early pioneers in quieter equipment. I think we will see further improvements in 2024 as the vendors really get on board with this. Um, and I think the ball also has room to improve. And I know that some people are working on a new style of balls. Foam balls bounce too high. A rubber ball weighs too much and carries too much velocity, too much energy. It endangers eyeballs. And it's, it's a genuine uh, change in the game. Uh, a unique thing about a pickleball is that this lightweight ball travels very slowly. And it also slows up as it moves through the air, being three inches in diameter. That's a unique aspect of the sport that allows uh, a very young person or a very old person to get to the ball, to make the shot. That's not true in tennis and many other sports. It's a unique characteristic of this sport that it has this paddle that hits a lightweight ball. Um, as Nalini said, I just ref at uh, US uh, National Senior Games. I was head referee for 1,500 players that played in the convention center. It was age brackets, age and skill brackets. We had 12 men in the 85 and up singles category. The court's only 20 feet uh, wide, 44 feet long. 
And so uh, it's not that big a court. And men 85 and up uh, played the game. Um, we had another player, I had a number of players uh, in their 80s playing this game. So it's a unique aspect of the game is that 10 year old kids and 80 year old people can play the game because the ball travels slowly. If you get hit with the ball, it's a, a one ounce shot and it moves usually quite slowly. If you get hit with a 10 or 20 mile per hour pickleball hit, it's not going to hurt you as long as you're wearing some eye protection. And so that's another unique aspect of the game. So it has advantages over, in my mind, any other sport. The sport is not going away, but I am committed to uh, do what I can to work with vendors and work with clients to help mitigate the sound problem. And that is that becomes a more standard thing and people understand the problem better. I hope this will get easier and less communities will decide to simply convert from tennis to pickleball without giving it any thought. That is happening all over the the country and in Canada, it's happening right in Pittsburgh, where I live. Um, and so we have to uh, get communities to be aware that you do need to bring the sound level down. How low? My view, after talking, have uh, almost 100 clients in 100 communities now around the U.S., you need to bring, bring the sound level down to about the background noise level, the ordinary background noise level. And in a quiet community, that's below 50 dBA. You need to get the sound level down to 50 dBA or thereabouts. In Bonita Bay, the uh, pickleball hits uh, will range from up to 48 or 49 dBA at our closest neighbor's home. And uh, that's with the sound barriers, quieter balls and paddles. And that's a successful story. Um, now, in a little noisier community, 55 dBA is acceptable. And there's an ANSI recommendation for sound to be below 55 dBA for, um, for, for sound levels. But uh, I think that if the sound level is 60 or 65 dBA in general at about the level of uh, voice communication, you're going to find that it's very difficult to deal with on a continuous basis. If you have an individual court, a private court, where someone plays a couple hours a day, that's not really a problem. Uh, but if you have uh, typical uh, club courts where play starts at 8 a.m., sometimes it goes to uh, 8 p.m. and beyond if there are lights on the court, it is a problem. And communities need to understand that. And we're hoping to uh, work with many of them and to uh, work with the vendors so there are more tools available to bring the sound level down. Laney, that's the uh, coverage uh, that I was hoping to do. Um, and I'd be happy to open this to questions, unless Very you think good. I'll put something out. Well, uh, no, I think um, moving on to questions is a great uh, idea. I have a couple in the hopper. Um, one that occurs to me, you were just talking about how the fact that the ball moves slowly, the lighter ball, is good for the seniors and the, and the youngsters. But isn't it almost the case where you have two different levels of pickleball? You've got your pro players, and they're going to smash the hell out of that ball. And then you have your recreational social players. Well, so, let, let me address that. Yes, uh, I, please. I, the game is unique in a variety of ways. Um, I played against a pro tennis player. I couldn't return a single shot against a pro tennis player. I could never return a single serve. Pickleball has an underhand serve. I played against pro uh, pickleball players. I can stay on the court with them. They'll win the points. They might win 11-0, but you can stay on the court and get the ball back because you have time to get to the ball. And when they hit a really hard shot, it still slows up. And uh, if you're standing 14 feet away from them and you get hit with the ball, usually doesn't hurt as long as you've got eye protection on. So wow. I'm, I've been happy to stand face to face and play against them. And this lightweight ball doesn't hurt. No other sport is quite like that. No, I understand the, uh, that aspect of it. But, but we had a member the other day speaking to the fact that in the evening, the sound is much louder with the young people playing than it is during the day. So that was my question to you is, if it's a harder hit, is it a... And, and you mentioned the decibel aspect of it. What we're all struggling with is measuring the impact on noise annoyance, uh, you know, um, end result of this yeah. impulsive burst, right? Burst of air. Yes. Um, yes. So my question is, if with the harder hits, even though it's a softer ball, is it a more annoying sound? Has that been proven? Or is this um, person well, just... 
the harder someone can hit, uh, that power transfers directly to sound. And uh, the hardest I can hit is several decibels. You know, three decibels is twice the power. And I've compared myself. I was running measurements with a very hard-hitting, high-level player. And his shots all were three decibels louder than mine. It says he was twice as strong as me. Is that true? Yes, I think it is true. And so but three... he's not 10 decibels louder. I think the hardest hitters are going to be a few decibels louder than the average male hitter. And it translates directly in power. It, it isn't a huge difference. And the hardest hitters play a soft game that's dramatic. They don't hit hard shots until the soft game accidentally lifts the ball up. Mm -hmm. It's actually the people right out of tennis that show up in a tennis court and believe hitting smash shots all the time is the way to win. They find out that's not the way to win. But I say, right. no, the uh, high level players don't hit 10 dB harder than me. They hit 3 dB harder than me. And 3 dB, I know 10 dB is more than double or something like that. What is 3 yes. dB? Yeah. 3 dB is a, is a small change. It's 25% louder, but it's three decibels on your sound level meter. Now, I didn't talk much about sound level meters. I have recommended meters to some of you, and I suggested you not get one with too many buttons. It gets confusing. I was recommending for a while this uh, spur because it only has uh, one mode. It has fast max hold or not max hold, and I rather like it for measurements. But um, someone in the group came up with this uh, Tedetto that actually does quite well. It compares very well. It has two buttons. It can be a little more confusing. But if you use this meter and measure hits of the highest level players, they will be about 84 dBA at uh, 20 feet. That's about where the numbers are. Right. If I do that, it'll be around 81 dB at 100 feet. You right. can go from that math in physics and predict the sound at any distance. And okay. That's just what we do when we do our calculations. All right. We're we going to move. Uh, we're going to be high level players using ordinary equipment when we do a sound prediction. Thank you so much. So, Donna, you have a question. Yes. Thank you. Um, our pickleball club has, uh, is it in a, a retirement community? A, 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 it's actually not a, a, a gated community. And we have 100 or 200 players and uh, houses too close. So, we put up a, a sound barrier, a, a acoustic fence, and we have encouraged people to use the vice um, diatom vice paddle. And it was so much quieter and a lower pitch, which is I think as important as the decibels, um, that the neighbors nearby bought a dozen of them for our club so that people who didn't buy, we have about a hundred people who bought them individually. But what I'm trying to figure out is you mentioned a couple others, like the, I, we've tried the Q1, the quiet one, but you said something about a whisper and a muffler. Uh, can you tell me, get me the names and do you think they're any quieter than the vice? Yes. Okay. I have a, a vice right here. And, yeah, I saw, I saw um, you yeah, I, I rather like to play with it, but I will say this. Uh, there are some people that believe that, and it does, it has um, a higher bounce. It's called the coefficient of restitution. When a ball hits this, it comes off faster than off an ordinary face. Um, and it's about 20% more energy coming off the face. Um, it does provide a somewhat quieter environment, and it has some innovations. It's a foam core. It's got holes in it. And when this hits a ball and it vibrates back and forth, some of that air goes through the holes instead of just being pushed at your ear. So I rather like this paddle with the caveat that you could argue that it's a somewhat more dangerous paddle. And it, right. it, we have people in our community who refuse to use it as a result. And, and, yeah. and, it says, and it clearly is not tournament approved and it would not be tournament approved. I right. think this is an early experimental paddle. I hope the people that make this will make others like it that do get tournament approval. The problem with this is it has a higher flex than an ordinary paddle. And that flex stores energy and it flings the ball back with a little more power. So I'd rather not recommend this paddle. Um, the uh, Master Athletics paddle does not have that. It achieves um, its quieter and low. And this is a very low pitch, by the way. It's two right. octaves lower. It's about it's 250 like hertz. It's a low thump. It's also but, short. It's and and it's rather, rather 
fairly inexpensive in comparison to the vice, which is $225. This is $165. This is a safe paddle because its coefficient of restitution, its bounce is not any higher. So I have to take a bounce height into account. The pickleball muffler, oh, by the way, I didn't talk about balls. And if you're using in your community the, the Diatom vice, one thing you might do is get people to go to a softer ball like use, the Monarch or the Onyx. We use the Onyx here too. Okay. All right, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good choice. Although, let me say this, the Pure 2 is a higher bouncing ball. It's illegal for tournaments because it's a higher bouncing ball. And so what that means is you're using a high bouncing ball on a paddle that has higher bounce. And so ball speed is increased and you have to at least take um, safety into account. I would instead suggest the Onyx Fuse ball, which is a lower bouncing ball and it would be a safer ball to play with. But both the Fuse and the um, and the uh, Pure too um, are quieter by about three decibels than the Dora or the Franklin. And I suggest people try this ball. It's what we use in Bonita Bay. And the tournament players resisted it and the tournament players go somewhere else in practice before tournaments. Uh, but this ball makes a remarkable dis difference. This is the Onyx Fuse. And, um, and I, I rather like the ball. It retains a legacy of the sport, which is a slow, soft game. And the ball also lasts a long time. So I, I uh, suggest this ball as a good alternative. But I believe new balls will be on the market next year, which will be further reduction in sound. Great. And tell me again about the muffler that you... All right. Yeah, the muffler... Um, it has this foam layer. If you look at a muffler, it's got a layer of foam inside. And uh, the foam muffler does reduce the sound of play. I think it's worth trying. And I think you have to get used to the differences in play. It will also change the flight of the ball somewhat. Uh, but it does reduce the sound. And when I've hit with it, I personally don't notice any difference. I'm not a high-level player, but I don't notice much difference. And so I rather like how it plays. It can be slipped over nearly any paddle, and uh, it's a way to uh, reduce the sound without going out and buying all new paddles. This paddle costs $225. The pickleball muffler, I think, is uh, under $40, and it'll okay. slip over nearly any paddle. By the way, once I had 20 orders to uh, the paddles, they gave. I became a dealer for Diatom. Yeah. Uh, and they, so, so if you have a community and you get yourself organized, you can get a better price. Great. Thank you, Donna. We're going Thank to go you. to uh, the Vitas. Did you still have a question, Vitas? Yeah, I, I have a few actually. In Benita Bay, your post looks like they're spaced about five feet apart. Isn't that the case? Uh, that's right. Yeah, we um, originally had been 10 feet apart in a previous fence. The uh, sections of um, sound material are 54 inches wide. They overlap two inches. And so we uh, placed the posts at about every joint in the uh, sound blankets. The sound blankets are 12 foot high um, and they're bolted at the top, the middle and the bottom. They're not bolted to the bottom um, and near the ground. Yeah. Instead, they bolt to a baseboard, but you are oh. right. Spacing is about five feet. I'm assuming you consulted the structural engineers for that. And it's also a heavy duty fence. Uh, we get a lot of wind in Florida and it survived Hurricane Ian with the barriers exactly. uh, bolted to the yeah. center. We, we have about 10 foot spacing and I was proving the village that it's not going to hold in the big wind and they disagreed with me. So I said, okay, well, whatever. They should, if they, they should take their barriers down during very high wind. Right. So uh, Nalini's question was regarding that power play. So ding versus the regular power play, what's the difference in sound level? Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, by the way, some paddles are called power paddles and some are called control paddles. That's a right away giveaway. Uh, your community should not be using power paddles if sound is a problem. They, everybody should be using control paddle. This um, the, uh, Yola is a control paddle. And the soft shots are more than 10 decibels quieter. The soft shot is just to get the ball over the net. It's only going, it can only travel about uh, 14 feet or 12 feet, and it's probably 20 decibels quieter than the put away. Exactly, so exactly. Last kind of level game, there's a lot of soft shots. Someone accidentally hits it high, and then it's a hard shot. Right, versus regular class, beginners, I can't hear them. The power players come in, oh my God, it's a whole yes. different yes. level. 
Yeah, so beginners don't know how to get power up. Beginners usually don't, unless they come right out of tennis or out of platform tennis, which is a... Right. a so the last question is, 1% problematic courts, is that accurate figure? According to our directors, yes, 1% courts in the country are problematic. Let's I don't, I don't think I can come up with um, a percentage uh, because there are tens of thousands of uh, courts, public courts that are published, but I'll bet there's another set of tens of thousands of courts. I know a number of places in Pittsburgh and in Maryland where I am right now where there are just tennis courts that were painted over and no one has made any uh, uh, record of that uh, where you can find pickleball courts in many places, but where you convert a tennis court in center, center city that usually leads to a, a sound problem. And even even all the thousands of courts that are listed on the USA Pickleball database, uh, there's no assurance that we know what all the neighbors are thinking and feeling from those locations. Right, right. We, do, we don't. That's have just a made up. We don't know where, who made it up, but that's just a made up uh, statistic. I'm going to move to Amand and then Mike C. Uh, okay, thank you. So, hey, Bob. So two quick questions for you. So I know that we've been talking a lot about decibels and I understand, um, especially because most um, or most uh, city, county noise ordinances are surrounded, are associated with decibels. But um, as you know, and as you talked about, frequency, pitch, uh, impulsiveness of the noise has come out of a lot of the stuff I've been reading about. Those are huge issues as well. For example, I sit in my backyard and I'm, I don't know, about 150 feet away from the, from the, the let's see, six courts, and then another three courts that my county has uh, decided to just, you know, stripe over right in the middle of our residential neighborhood with no sound mitigation. I have neighbors that are less than 100 feet away. Um, and I can't sit them, and I just hear the constant, you know, with six plus three courts, nine courts at times, the pop, 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 and the frequency being such that it just bounces off of everything, even in my backyard. And so, you know, what, is your, what are your thoughts about, I mean, I know you were talking primarily about frequent, about decibels before, but what, is, what, what could be done about the frequency issues as related to, you know, as far as that goes, aside from, aside from fencing or, you know, some sort of, you know, wrap, you know, well, I'm not going to get that to be part of my second question, but first question is, what are your thoughts about that? How do we deal with that or how it gets dealt with? So I would say um, these pitches, the pitch that many of these paddles have is an accident as the vendors are attempting to achieve some effect of ball control, and they have not been focusing on trying to bring the pitch down. Uh, the Master Athletics is different than that, and I would be pleased, Melina, if you would like me to share another screen to show you the difference in pitch very specifically, um, and I think we it will be clear to people how different it is. Uh, where a fiberglass hard face paddle, a hard paddle vibrates very quickly. What you need is damping, something that damps the high frequency mo movement. And uh, you can add damping a variety of ways. Um, the Pro Kenex paddle has little flakes of metal inside that does also, and it's meant to reduce tennis elbow. Tennis elbow is caused sometimes by vibration of, the, of a tennis racket or a pickleball paddle. That vibration also is what causes the air to vibrate. And so we need vendors to build damping into their paddles. It has to be intentional. And when they focus on that, I think we will see substantial improvements. I can tell you that the pitch of the uh, typical fiberglass face paddle, and I, I could show you a plot of the spectrum. Okay, all right, I'm gonna show you first a fiberglass face paddle and yeah. All right, you're going to see exactly that, but in great contrast between one paddle and another. Tremendous variation. So I'm going to share a screen with you now. And I can, I can definitely, not to interrupt you, Bob, but just, just sitting outside in my, in my front yard and just watching the play, I can, you can hear the difference between different paddles. I mean, it's pretty yes, obvious yes, that there's yes, a very big is. difference. Yeah, now how do you get people to stop using the 3995 Wonder? That's a different issue. All right, so I'm sharing the screen. That's This is the Raven. It's an engaged Raven. It's an ordinary fiberglass paddle. It's been around for more than 10 years. They don't make it anymore, but they're, they made many thousands of, of this paddle. So I'm gonna show you some characteristics of this paddle, and I think you'll understand it. So here's just in our, uh, we built a chamber. It's a drop chamber, a high bay chamber, and we measure LAF max of this paddle. 
This 43, ignore that. That's just the background noise level. It's real time while we're running the test. But it records the loudest hit. It also records the peak. And the peak here is 116. LAF max was 88.9. The L- LAF min, min meant between hits, it would drop down to 43. So that's that's ordinary. Our ordinary background noise in our room is about 43 decibels. We have a calibrated uh, setup, a calibrated microphone. This ball, uh, this paddle, when hit with the Franklin ball, resulted in 88.9 dBA sound. But look at this. Here's the pitch. This is a plot of amplitude versus frequency, with this being one kilohertz. Now, musical note C4 is down here, and musical note C5 is in here. I'm sorry, here's C, yeah, C6 is here. This is musical note C6. Look at the energy it has, and this says... If I can read the number right there, 84.3 dBA. It's a very pronounced vibration right at 1.2 kilohertz, which is a very annoying frequency. And by the way, it's the same frequency that beepers on backup uh, on dump dump trucks and, and garbage trucks use right in that range, accidentally, of humans. And so if I look at the waveform, though, look at the ringing. Here is the main hit. The big power spike is right down at the bottom of the screen. This is when it hits the ball. And by the way, there's a little bit of trash riding on top of this. That is the ball vibrating. The ball flies away and that stops. And then this darn paddle rings and rings and rings and rings. And it goes on and on and on. There's nothing that dampens it. And its peak amplitude is around here. It's still ringing. at, And this looks like a 1.2 kilohertz sine wave. That's what it is. So now let me go to a different paddle, and I'm going to um, stop sharing this one, and I'm going to bring up a different screen. You'll see a much different one. Um, okay, and here's the question. Yeah, I, my sec- yeah I, I know almost out of time, but go ahead. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to now share the uh, Master Athletics. I'll jump right to that one. You'll see the difference. It's so st- substantially different. Okay, um, Master Athletics Paddle. I think I probably have a picture of the paddle here. Well, I have the paddle. Okay, we're going to get to the waveform in a second. Using exactly the same test setup, look at the, the levels. 80.9. This is eight decibels quiet. It's the same ball, the same exact balls, Franklin X ball. And the Z peak was only a little bit lower, but the uh, LAF max was 80 decibels lower. What this says is the peak power applied to the ball with this paddle is a little bit uh, lower. That's this soft surface they use, but its sound is about nine decibels lower. And look at the difference in uh, in, in the spectrum. Again, this is amplitude versus frequency. Here's one kilohertz. Here's the limit of human speech is in this range. Look what has happened. The main pitch is moved down to 391 hertz nearly two octaves lower. It's a thud. It's not a pop. They intentionally did this. And yeah, they gave up a little power. And I'm hoping they'll develop a a version of this that has a little more power, but still gets this low pitch. This will sound much different to you if if the players began to use it. And some of the players will in fact complain because it's a weird sound and they don't hear the hit from the other side um, as well. So that's what's going on. That's what's happening in paddles. This is a company, Master Athletics, that tried to make a quiet one. Because they went to a rubber material, it was not approved by USA Pickleball for tournament play. Plus, it lacks a little power. And so we find uh, you you have some trade-offs here. I think we're going to find some paddles that play very well, but have a low pitch. And even if their sound level is about the same, if you bring the pitch down two octaves lower, I assure you that you, the the neighbors of courts, will feel at least they've made some real progress in the sound of pickleball. More questions? Uh, sure, I'd like, I'd like to make a few comments. First of all, I have a bit of an engineering background myself. I want to thank you for your excellent explanations of all these factors. And I think the science is important. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to go back to what I think this meeting is more about, though, and that's I'm a diehard pickleball player for the last five years. I was president of a club. And <clears throat> the people who are suffering from noise because of the being contiguous to a 
court. I mean, they, they need some relief. And um, I, I think that's what most of the people on this call, I think that's why they're here. So let me give you an example of what we had to deal with. We're in an over 55 community in Illinois. Uh, we went from 160 members to over 500 in three or four years. And people run out and they buy paddles. And a lot of them bought the same paddle that I started with, which is an Onyx uh, Z5, which is probably the noisiest paddle in existence. And the most popular paddle. And the most popular. And it's, and, 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 it's, and it's marketed in such a way. Yes. And I retired it because as I got better, I needed a, a, a paddle with yes. different characteristics. Right. 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 And we, we were using Franklin X's and uh, they were cracking and they were a bit expensive. And we went to the Fuse G2. Yes. Nobody, nobody knows the difference. We're, we're a group of people where 95% of them are there for social and exercise reasons. And the few people who wish to play in tournaments are directed, well, buy some balls and practice on your own on the side or go somewhere else, uh, and which is not common, but does, does occur. But So I don't want to make the, the focus about that. Uh, I will make one co strong comment, though, that USA Pickleball could assume eventually a role that's similar to the Royal and Ancient and the uh, USGA Golf and specifying characteristics of equipment. Um, I mean, if you, this sh I would be very supportive of something like the charts that you just had, that the sound characteristics on a certain test must be under certain standards by let's say 2027 or some future date when people could say, okay, we're gonna give you two or three years to phase out paddles that violate a standard and balls that violate a standard and they will no longer be permitted. The same thing that uh, golf clubs are limited into the size of the driver and the balls can only have a certain uh, uh, coefficient of restitution to control the distances, which has unfortunately led to golf courses being amended for the pros. Yes. And that's not the problem. So I think there's a role for a national organization to do that. And also a role for a national organization to have specifications that would guide zoning commissions and village boards and everywhere like that who are all treating these things as one-off problems without any guidance and creating emotional conflicts without uh, some kind of standards. Now, I saw the article from Paddletech, and I was shocked that Paddletech would recommend a 500-foot minimum. I mean, that's that to me was extreme on the other end. There's a balance in there somewhere that would reach the standards of reasonable background noise, and somebody needs to come out with uh, a, a serious paper that would say, all right, right now we're at 140 feet. We've had no complaints. Now, maybe it's because we're using the Fuse G2. Maybe it's because uh, people are really, there's only a few powerful players. Whatever it is, we're not getting complaints. Is that too small? Is that too short for many other people? Maybe there should be a standard somewhere that could be established. So I'll just toss that out because uh, I, don't, I think people are interested more in that kind of information than the way we can modify that. But people are gonna need some standard or else the paddle manufacturers are, and the ball manufacturers will continue to press on with power, control and speed and oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, and how do you get 500 people to change to a new paddle? But they would, if they knew that two years from now, they would need to have a paddle that's, that meets a standard established by some national certifying organization. So. I agree with all those comments. I'm, I'm gonna uh, step in on this one because you know, the residents, I spoke with someone today who was just on day six of, uh, you know, seven days in a row, and it's driving her completely bonkers. She doesn't have two years. She's going to have to oh, move. Yeah, okay. okay. I, 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 and I, I, so that, I mean, that's that we should be behind. Those yeah, people exactly. need relief. They do. And, and, and sometimes want it, those people have relief. And what yeah. I wanted to say was that sometimes it's 500 feet. We don't know. I was talking with Bob uh, in pre prep for this call, and we both agreed there's an art and science to this. Just like when you build a concert hall or an outdoor amphitheater, it's going to be a combination of factors. So I think it is really difficult to have um, blanket standards that you know everyone can fit to. But I um, really appreciate you speaking up on this. Or just at least minimal standards. Yes. Yes. Like and now there's nothing. That's right. Except a, that's right. Except 
and, isolated incident. And I did have a quick question, which is how can we as a group influence the uh, drafting of these uh, standards? Bob, is that is that a process that we can engage in? Um, uh, USA Pickleball is very open to inputs from the community, especially if you're members of USA Pickleball. But for instance, a letter from this group um, to uh, Carl Schmitz, uh, Director of Standards, USA Pickleball, he would read it. It would say, it would tell him, yes, there are people very concerned about this. He knows that. And so I encourage more people to go to the governing body and uh, and seek some general standards. Ordinances are a great complication, by the way. Ordinances vary tremendously from community to community. I think it would be good for USA Pickleball to recommend uh, or the way ordinances should be structured so that uh, there's a more a common way required to determine if something I mean, is compliant. Something as basic as having a noise impact study, you know, just even yeah, saying right, that alone is a yeah. good start. Um, we're going to move on to, I believe, David is next and then Kathy. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Bob, I'm David Wright uh, with IMEG, and I enjoy your comments and I agree with your assessments and you've done some really good work, especially with the, um, the metric LAF max. And I, we get it, we understand it. You know, we, uh, we being uh, a team of engineers and acoustics design anything for noise control abatement. We're expert witnesses for uh, plan commissions. We do concert halls, we do the whole thing. My, my question to you is, or maybe my encouragement. Um, when we do plan commission, uh, either testimony or rebuttals, as I think everybody on the site knows, it's a lot of struggle just, and, and kind of like Mike said, it's a lot of struggle just to get people to make an agreement on what the metric and the number is. So LAF max 83, great, that's truth. That's science, that's the absolute, and that's real fact. However, the reality in noise is the definition of noise is anything is unwanted or whatever is unwanted. Therefore, it's it's my practice to try to get the numbers to be not explained in great detail. I, I don't agree that it's art and science and everything changes. Pickleball noise is really a very fundamental, simple thing. And what we do is say things like, and, and I'm just encouraging others to consider this, we'll go before a plan commission and say, you know, pickleball noise is, you know, it's 63 dBA at 100 hertz. Sometimes it's LAF max at 83, blah, blah, blah. And by the time I finish that single sentence, I've lost 95% of my audience, That's right? right. Yeah. And we all know that. And so there's arguments. Well, you know, it's like a chainsaw. Well, it's rock and roll. We think, we say things like, you know, it's really just like having a drum kit with a rim shot on a snare drum constantly driving from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night. That's what we're dealing with. Now, once they hear that statement, as opposed to 83 LAF max or whatever it may be, then they start to realize there's a real component they can relate to. And so we push hard to get that. The other thing we do, and you're, you're right on with your metrics and your your spectra and so forth. And I get it. We measure all the time every day with that kind of stuff. Here's what I tell people. The human ear is a tuned pipe. It's very small, very small diameter. It's a tuned pipe. We all can put our finger in here and we know that. So if you just say, hey, the tuned pipe is resonant to pick up the pickleball noise very efficiently, like a drum kit on the court. Now you you get somebody to come alongside and get them to understand what we're talking about. My question become, and, and so those are things that I would say to try to make this math relevant to people so they can come along, be encouraged and come to an agreement because most of the battle, most of the battle is trying to explain the metric and, and I've done it for decades and it's never going to be successful, frankly. It's just not going to be, especially if we have different metrics from experts. So if you say LAF max and I say LEQA, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, what or, ends up happening is that you feel like the engineering community is in disarray. You know, that's what, that's right. what we customers feel like. <laughs> and, and the city leaders listen to one and not the other. Um, if you could wrap it up, David, I have a quick announcement to make after that. 
No, I think that's it. I, I would just encourage the experts to agree on a relative a relative basis as opposed to stating facts and science solely because it just doesn't work. Don't we need the acoustics engineering societies and those folks to be uh, paying attention to this a little bit more? I think they're just well, beginning to do that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. Well, yeah. I'm not going to state anything else. I just want to, that's, a, that's good enough for the night. Great to me. meet Thank you. Thank you so much. And I will uh, pass along my thanks on, on behalf of Rob and myself to Bob Udetich. Uh I hope you can join us in the breakout room because it sounds like they'd like to keep talking with you for 15 minutes or so. But uh, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. Welcome, Tom. Glad I had an opportunity to talk about this. 